We left Sudan because of war and now we are going back for the first time in 20 years. I'm really going to, to go back to for my family. I'm excited to go back and help the people that I have been dreaming of helping. That's the house that Chris lived in when he was just a little bit older, when he was Isabella's age. It didn't take me long to feel like these are my family. It just felt like I'm in the right hand and with the right people. I'm one of them. Then he lived in one of these houses. And those guys come? And, and, and then all of his friends lived in all of these and little then, houses. And then those guys come? What guys, honey? Those big the, guys? the bad guys? Yeah. The bad guys? Yeah. I'm going back to Sudan for the first time since I fled. I'm trying to go and look for my parents that I've been separated for a long time. It's been 15 years. I had a dream that we get united and it's exciting when you're dreaming about it, but when you wake up and realize that whatever you're dreaming is not there, then but you keep it in you and you hope for it. If we lucky enough to find them, then I will have two parents. I'm going to have this family back in Africa, I'm going to have this family in America. I'll be a sports star in between. What did you make your house out of, though? You want to deal with me, I'd say? Well, I don't know. Out of what? The mud. Yeah, the no mud. <laughs> no mud. Welcome. My dress is hard to see the family that I have never seen for the last 20 years. The thing that I could remember back in 20 years would be when my mom came to me and sang a song to me. That song to my mom used to sing very good songs. When I came to Chicago in 2001, I was nervous because see when you get to a different country, I've never been here before, so it's really tough especially to meet different people. I thought they were strange, but they were very good people to welcome me. Still, I have a feeling of leaving family by, especially my mother. I want to go back and see my mother. I believe you are complete. Uh, you are complete as a man. You know what happened to your family. Either one of them or even two of them might be alive. And that kind of keeping hope is really uh, keeping me going. Returning to Sudan is something that my heart is telling me to do. But I can't meet Sudan. What would happen if I wouldn't find my family? Or what if I find my family in a dire situation? I'm looking forward to, to go and find out what happened to them and probably I would be a complete person by the time I would come there.
can be called a war. Me and my father were on the same place. The Arabs came and started shooting us all days and and three nights shooting. The shooting has been continued like that and never stopped. We were running and I was crying. My dad picked me up and he stole me. Sometimes he put me down. Try it, he can so that he can walk around with me. I asked my dad, am I gonna die? He said, no, you're not gonna die. Send some here, you're not gonna die. I started walking and that's when I met the people my age and started walking together. We lost thousands of lives. Many age men, many friends, we left them behind because they were unable to walk. Their feet were swollen and just sit down there and say, I can't make it. Those vultures will just fly down and just take their eyes off. My family duty as a young child was to look up at my father's house. When being a nurse, the more calm you have, then the more wealthy you are. I went to the grazing field in the morning. All of a sudden, I had a gunshot. I saw uh, four militia. So the young child, I never seen someone with a gun. That began me to to hide myself. I didn't reveal myself. Had they seen me before, I would have been shot dead. After I could not see them any longer, I was running as fast as I could to deliver the news. I saw a huge smoke of fire flowing into the air from the grid. Two gentlemen intercepted me on the way. And they said, now Gabriel did not go to the police. There is fighting. Come and go with us. I felt that I had to meet with my dad and tell him what happened because I had the responsibility of looking at the car. So I was not listening to them. They said, Well, this is a little boy. So the best solution for them was to get hold of me and put me on their back. And while this gentleman tried to bend down to grab hold of me, he was shot dead in front of me. I fled into the forest, climbed up in the tree. During the night, lions and hyena knew that a human being was present, but thank God that I was hiding in the tree. Some group of people came and just rested under the tree, and I said, what if I reveal myself? Would they kill me? And after I seen them, they looked like me. They were just speaking the same language, the dingo. And I said, good morning, I'm on the tree. I touched the group, you know, actually where my tiny boys came from. When they were coming down the past three weather, where is my mom and where is my dad? They gave me some water and toasted beef and they told me to, to follow the group. During the night, I, during, I dream as if I'm still with my mom, still with my father. And during the night, I cried for nothing. Too bad almost two months to come on night. So the war was still to come and the dad was to cross the desert to Ethiopia. We carried some water, and two days later, the other we had not finished. So we just go for months with no food. Some people tried to dig underneath the, the, the tree to find the soft part of the, the wet part of the soil, and they could squeeze into their mouths, and we eat much uh, to, to fill our stomachs, and I made it to a refugee camp in Ethiopia. My dad got sick in the camp and he was in the hospital and a week later he died and he probably knew that he was going to die so he told me I brought you up here let's get to school and get education I think he will be a good man in the future that was the last word he told me before he died I thought that that could be the end of my life but I took her and I didn't cry and I said okay um, I will see what happens next the war broke out in Ethiopia, 1991. We were chased out of the cannon at gunpoint. They forced us to the river Gilo. Many of us does not know how to swim, and many got shot by the river bank. And if you're lucky, you cross. If you're not, then those are the one over the men in the river. We gather at the, on the other side of the river, and then we start walking. We come to Sudan. And our enemies start bombing us. We only go one per person for mine not to, to blow us up. This little boy was sitting next to 
is dead now. So this boy picked him up and we took time to carry the boy. And then the, this guy in front of the guy who was carrying the boy, you know, pulled the tree and let it go. So the tree hit the boy. Well, here is, as you can see, just a little bit of the movie. Um, I know we have the movies here for those who want to see the rest. I know you guys are getting into it. But we do have that on who is going to finish up the stories and his journey back to Sudan and uh, seeing his mother once again. Okay? Again, let's give him another warm up applause. Thanks, Rodney, for the only introduction. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank the Wabandi Community College for inviting me to come and present the Building Up. I'm very thankful for that. For those of you who haven't heard my name, my name is Samuel. My name is Greg Maywal. Uh, first, I will start off with briefly about myself and then go into a lot of details about the project and all the journey that has pulled me from a young age to, to Ethiopia and to many refugee camps in Africa. Oh, I, I left home in 1987 with my dad when I had my lectures. Pulled the old villages, burned the old villages and other communities. So we had, we had to leave. So I left with my dad and leaving my mother where I don't even know. So we, we ran into a lot of groups of people who were leaving the country, running away for safety. So we walked. It was two month walk journey. Uh, leaving home all the way to Ethiopia. So we had, we had to walk three months, about two to, to three months on our way to Ethiopia. So it was very difficult for us actually to, we encounter a lot of problems. We survived from a lot of wild animals, hyenas and all of this stuff. So we, we also were starving also and, and thirst on a desert. We came across the Nile a month later, and many of uh, many young men who actually don't even know how to swim barely made it across all the way to Ethiopia. So many, many of the lost boys got drowned in River Nile. And I was lucky now because I wasn't my father, so we were using a bond of canoe that actually got me across the Nile, and I was, was able to cross to make it across all the way through. So I went to Ethiopia in the same year in 87, went to a refugee camps. Two months later, my dad died at a refugee camp at the UN hospital, so I was only six. So I had to go to, to pastor care where I lived there for about four years in Ethiopia in refugee camps. In 1991, the rebel overthrown the government of Ethiopia, so we had to leave the country, all the refugees. The rebel were clearing all the refugee camps, so we had to leave the country in 1981, 1991. We came to, to Sudan border, a town called Pachala, and we, we lived there for about two months again. The Antonov came and we bombed again, so we had to leave the, that town, so we came to eventually came to Kenya in, in, 19, in 1992, where we lived there for nine years in refugee camp. So we went to, I went to school there to find about a lot of boys in refugee camps. I was at the foster care, so we, we went, we go to school, and the foster care cooked for us, and you and paid them. So I was in refugee camp, they're going to school, and the life in refugee camp was not good. So. We had, we had to have only one meal a day that we can survive. There were over 80,000 refugee camps. I mean, 80,000 of people in refugee camps, especially Sudanese and other nationalities in the camps. So camp was overcrowded, or many different nationalities came. 
in, in Africa from different corners of the world who are refugees in the camps. There, we were there for a number of years and we had no choice. So the, the education in the camp was not even good enough. So people were dying from malaria, especially Kenya. We are in northern Kenya, very dry, where we, we don't have access to the water. So they have the tap, the end tap that they, you want to add, and we, we usually run out of water. Water shortages became a problem apart from even food. So we run into a lot of problems in the camp. In 2000, you and ACR decided, and they talked with the U.S. government, that they decided to bring this young man who spent most of their, half of their life in the refugee camp. So, so they began the process, and we were asked to write our life stories who will come here and so we wrote our life story and we are old. You have to be interviewed and when you pass you can you are ready you have to go seal of a, a medical checkup to make sure that you are okay at the um, to come here. So I passed the interview in two thousand one and I was ready to apply so to leave the camp with other guys. It was not, not everybody that had the interview, but most of the people failed the interview and they didn't make it here. So I came to Chicago in 2001, at the time that I left the camp, and I was stationed in Elgin. When I first came, I was lucky enough, so I got some volunteer, our family actually took care of me at that time. So I worked with them for about, about a month and a half. So they, they took care of me, they cooked for me, I eat in their home and they got me everything. After, after a month and a half, so I got my job. My first job was working at the UPS. So I told them that I can be on my own, so I was working part time and go to school at the same time, taking classes at night and in the morning, and goes to to work at the UPS at night. So you will the life there first to come here and start a good life, be able to have a job who we never had in the camps, and go to school at the same time. It was very challenging, though to have two things at a time, going to school and and working at the same time, but it was worthy because when we were in the camp, we were in the school. The school actually was not, there were no teachers that could teach us good, I mean, I mean in the school. But when we came here, it was better than, than when we were in the camp going to school don't have a meal at all. You think about what you, you want to eat, what you can eat tomorrow. But it was it was good that we came here and and we we had school more about got to school and work at the same time. So in two thousand two I I went I I was working in Carol Stream so I had to transfer to my work because I didn't like commuting. I went back and forth every day, so I moved to DuPage County, and I was went to Elgin Community College and the COD, I mean College of DuPage, and I was taking night classes and work in the morning. Did graduate at COD in 2008 and transferred to Benedictine, Benedictine University. I'm now a senior, so let's all be. I'll get finished actually early next year. So in 2007, I decided since I have seen my parents for many years, 20 years, so I decided to go back and see my family. So we decide that since we are going home for the first time, look at our family, which we don't even know where they are. So. My cousin, Gabriel Bull, who actually spoke in, on the film, and the other guy, my colleague, Cole Graham, 
who had actually a family, he lived in Arizona and he has also a very, very wonderful family that he saw in the movies today. That the family that holds him for a number of years and he's still living with them right now. So it's very lucky. So we, we called, we had to talk to Jen. Jen was a friend to Gabriel Ball. So, and Jen agreed with us to go home and, so that she can take our footage. So she can take a two film hour trip. So, and well, there was another guy, a journalist from Connecticut. He also volunteered. So a team of five people, we went in 2007 for the first time. This is where I met my mother and other siblings. So I was lucky enough to find my mother alive and the other siblings. So I have big family. I'm, I'm the oldest of the six family in the family. So they were all alive when I went there. It was very emotional. I'm coming to see a family and meet them to see me for the first time. They didn't even know that I was alive, but they were stunned and see me when I just came and I didn't even tell them because I had no way to talk to them to tell them that I was going to be coming because there were no phone to tell them that I'm coming. So it was, a, it was a great surprise to see the family when I just came and they couldn't believe that it was me. There was a lot of dancing, very emotional. The people danced throughout the day. It was like an endless celebration. It was very good. Apart from that, the, the images were heartbreaking when I see a lot of people suffering and see a lot of needs. It was very emotional. So uh, it wasn't, it was very tough to deal with that situation, but um, I, wouldn't, I can't really imagine how like it be to see a family that you haven't met and see them alive and they're struggling. So, there was a lot of things that we need to fix when I went there. Gabriel had a plan that he was going to go and build a school in his own village. And Cor was planning to, to bring medicine to, to, to the community so that there was no particular health care at all. People are dying of, of malaria, cholera, all these kind, simple, treatable, preventable diseases. Just kill people in the villages because there was no access to clean to clean health care and everything. In my own village when I first came, I couldn't even get water to drink. So people walk three hours, commute three hours back and forth getting very stagnant water, not even clean water from 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 the rivers. And cholera was killing people instantly day and night. So I decided that the only way that I can help them to clean, to bring clean drinking water in the village. So I decided that that I, when I come back, I didn't I didn't promise them, but I told the villagers that let me just go back, but I'll see what I can help you guys. So that was in 2007 when we made the movie. We took all the footage and we came back in 2007. So. It was a lot of work to, to put all these footage, so I had to translate 80 hours of footage, 80 hours of footage of DVDs from Dinka into English, so that a lot to do. And after we finished the movie, it was a screened into a lot of places and we were able to, to, get, to raise a lot of money. And in 2009, I went back home. I took a leap of absence from the university because the situation that I have seen the family in Kimi actually, I was not in a good mood at all. So the school was dead there, but my mind was not in it because I was thinking about the, the family and, and the, situation, the, the situation that they are. So I went back again. After I came, we translated and I raised a lot of money. I raised about 20000 I went back in 2009. And I was able to drill six wells for the first time, for the whole in, in about four villages for the first time to to, to drink. I drilled what they call hand pumps, the taps, six of them, and they were able to drink clean water for the first time. After I drilled the well, the color just stopped right away, and 
and I didn't see pe many people dying of cholera. They were able to drink clean water and their animal too, which is actually most Dinka Sudanese don't don't have any, they don't have any, most of them don't have money. Their animals are their source of income. So when animals die during the summer, when when rivers get dried up and they don't have water, their animal dies and they don't have anything to eat. So with they, 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 that mean the villagers run out of food because they survive from milk of cow and and cow they can they can either kill the cow from meat and they can survive. So it was a great accomplishment when I see the cholera would just stop there and and and, and well were drilled. Korogarang also took some medication to the village and and people were able to get basic medication to help themselves. So Kor is now still raising money to to help to help Pan Clinic that was built in two thousand in two thousand nine. And and Gabriel Balding built a school in his own village and that school got finished this year, early this year. And he's now trying to get fun an open school and get teacher training so that kid can get teachers and be able to go to a new school in his own village. So three of us were doing different projects but they're all in one umbrella. If people don't have a school, if people, the, the only way that we can help people is to get educated so that they can get get great education and get a better life and be able to make good money. Also, if kids go to school and they end up clean drinking water, they can still get, they can still die from cholera. A lot of, a lot of diseases like stagnant water that they've been drinking. Also, kids need also health, health care. They need medicine when it gets sick, you should be able to get medicine. So that what three of us did, so we are still doing that and 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 most of us, Gabriel finished his degree about two years ago and he's also now traveling in different corners of the country to raising money to fund his school and and Cole also going to school and also still raising money for, for health care to, to fund that clinic that was built. So uh, to come to another thing is um, the referendum. The field was signed in 2005 in Sudan. That in a 21 year of civil war in Sudan. And last this year, February, Southern were able to vote for a referendum. And they vote overwhelmingly by 98.5% that in favor of suffrage and independent South. So South Sudan will be an independent country in July 9, this summer. And they still have what they call interim period to do transition government between the North and the South. So they're still doing that, but the focus is now to, to build a new country a newborn country in the south in Sudan. We have been born here in Chicago. I bought it for that. We have is a place in Chicago where you can go and board if you are a Sudanese. So most of us just went there, and we are really we are really excited about the result when we saw the result. Everybody being like, what happened in 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 Sudan for the last twenty three years because of these. Um, the dominant government regime in the in the north actually were just want to run the, the the country according to Islamic law. So that was the issue that forced a lot of Sudanese leave the country. They send the militia come and and, and get all the cattle, burn down the village in the south because they just want to convert everybody to most of them. If you, you want to be with them, you have to be Muslim, which is not. So it was a war of religion and 
and more, most of it were actually the, the resources because a lot of oil is in the south. Another government are taking a lot of, taking all the oil and which is supposed to be getting 50 split, but we don't get that, the south and don't get that at all. So it was a lot of problem between north and south that let the north break away. That's why now they vote for a random and, and they were, they are, they are, they are, they are sexy. They, they get succeeded and they will be a new country early July this summer. And that, that the main thing are going now in Sudan. So Sudan has been in Europe recently because of these things, but still now there are a lot of, a lot of dragging back, especially on the, the borders, like the the rich oil region in southern Sudan between the north and south. This is where they have like 80% of the oil and that has become a big problem now between two governments, the north and the south, because of the oil. It, people are working on it, but it seems to be impossible, but the CFA is guiding them, the one they signed in 2005. They have to work with that and they need a lot of, a lot of help from international communities, especially the U.S. and, and UN and also the the Europe so to get help with this. So this is a complicated situation but that one you need a lot of help from corner student I mean international communities and the other 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 places around the world to help with these uh, um, peace process. So it's gonna be it's gonna be a little bit hard, but people out there, so Southern Sudan are tired of this, and and they are willing to to manage themselves, to govern themselves, to be a separate country, and we support that a lot because it is because of this war, war of no reason, killing people and people just hated each other that led us actually to many refugee camps and. And that the one led by two million people dead now, and and thousand and four about four million displaced in different in in, in different refugee camps in Africa and even here. So to come back about the people would wonder why we call lost boys. So to come into that, and I would say I'm a former lost boys. I'm not a lost boys anymore. I used to be a lost boy. I'm a former lost boy. They call us the lost boy because they lost from our parents. So that's a nickname that gave to us when we, when we were in the camp and come here because we are people who lost from, lost from our parents that, that call us the lost boys. So this is how the lost boys become a title to, to, to many young men who came to America. So we get that name because we lost from our parents. But I was fortunate enough to find my family and I would say I'm a former lost boy. So of Sudan, but that the title. So we, we've been called, we've been called lost boys, we call the lost from our parents. So. Um, for now, I will open up for questions because most of you didn't get to see the movie, but I have about 10 DVDs here. They are available for twenty dollars, and all the proceeds are going to the water project. And if you're interested, you can get one up here. And and I will keep a lot of time for questions. If you guys have questions, a personal question, question about the movie, about the projects that we are doing, about anything, I'm ready to answer. So I'll give. You a chance for you guys to so ask as many questions as you want and I'll be happy for it. Right. We're going to show a little bit uh, about your homecoming. Okay. So we're going to show that video. Do you want to play that video? Yeah, we're going to show when we first met you. Oh, you know, I don't know.